Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. This is the first video in lecture four for our series entitled Section 1.3, Combining Functions. And it turns out we've already had some practice combining functions already. Uh, previously, we talked about how one can add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions. And when you combine functions together using these the four arithmetic operations, you are creating a new function, and that function is produced by just combining the y coordinates of said functions uh, using the appropriate operation of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So we did this numerically. One could do it graphically as well, where you again add together the y coordinates for some common x value inside their domains. And so in this situation, if we take the function f of x to be 4x squared and g of x to be 4x minus 3, Adding the functions just means adding together their y coordinates, f of x plus g of x. The fact that the function's now given algebraically to us doesn't really change much. f of x, I want you to be aware, is it's not the function, it's the y coordinate associated to the function here. The function is the rule. It assigns to each x coordinate, f will assign to each x coordinate the corresponding number four times that number squared. And similarly, g will associate to any number x the number four times that number minus three, which we express in this algebraic formula. So when you'll see f of x, that means the y coordinate. g of x is the associated y coordinate to the function g. And so we're adding those things together, which then you'll take 4x squared plus 4x minus three. And in a polynomial expression like this, we would add together any like terms, combine like terms is often the phrase we use here. Now f and g don't actually have any common terms between them, so the sum is just gonna be 4x squared plus 4x minus three. Now when it comes to the difference, the only thing that's, that's not the same here is that we replace the plus with a minus sign, right? And that then affects that we're gonna subtract g of x from f of x. And so the only difference here is that we have to distribute the negative one on the 4x minus three, pun intended there. And so we're going to get 4x squared minus 4x plus 3. The plus 3 comes from a negative, negative x. It's a double negative. And so when it comes to subtraction, the most common mistake is we forget to distribute the negative sign in all pieces in the second group. So as long as you're careful about the distribution of the negative sign right there, subtraction is no different than addition, really. Subtraction we can think of as just adding the negative. Um, speaking of the distributive rule, when it comes to multiplying the functions, f times g, this just means f of x times g of x, so we're going to get 4x squared times 4x minus 3, in which case, since g has two terms in it, we need to distribute the 4x squared on the two pieces. The first piece will be 4x squared times 4x, for which case 4 times 4 gives us 16, the coefficient there, and x squared times x, we're going to add together the exponents x uh, x squared times x will be x to the 2 plus 1, which is x cubed, uh, as we can see right here. And so the product of the first two will be a 16x cubed. When you multiply the second two together, you get 4x squared times negative 3. The coefficients multiply together, you get negative 12 right there, and then you'll get an x squared. So again, if we can do, if we can do the distributive property and we know how to just multiply things together, like x to the a times x to the b equals x to the a plus b, we can handle basic multiplication of functions like this. And then so finally with division, uh, well, to divide f by g, we'll take the formula for f of x, we'll divide it by the formula of g of x, and then simplify if appropriate. Now at this stage of the game, uh, it turns out no simplification is necessary. You got 4x squared on top, you get 4x minus 3 in the bottom. There's no common divisors amongst the two, and so that's its simplified form right there. This gives us the formula for the four combinations of these two functions, f and g. But one thing we have to talk about also is their domains. When it comes to our functions, f of x, for example, its domain is gonna be all real numbers. There is no restriction on multiplication. You can multiply any numbers together. So we can square any number, we can times it by four. The domain of g is likewise gonna be all real numbers because there's no restriction on multiplication, there's no restriction on subtraction, so it's gonna be all real numbers. As a consequence, the domain of f plus g, f minus g, and f times g, in general, this is just the intersection of the domains of f and g. And so since f and g have no restrictions, the domains of f plus g, f minus g, and f times g will be all real numbers as well. Now things get a little bit more hairy when it comes to f divided by g. Although 
F and G have no restrictions. Division does have a restriction. We can't divide by zero. So looking at the denominator here, the 4x minus 3, we have to determine when does 4x minus 3 equal 0. And this linear equation we can solve. We add 3 to both sides. We get 4x equals 3. We divide both sides by 4. We're going to get x equals 3 fourths. So this is what makes the denominator equal 0. And so therefore, to find the domain of f divided by g, we look for all numbers not equal to 3 fourths. That is, x should not equal 3 fourths. Or if you write this in interval notation, you're going to get uh, negative infinity to 3 fourths, union 3 fourths to infinity. So we want every number except for 3 fourths. And so we can very easily combine uh, functions by addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. These were polynomial functions, so it wasn't too difficult. Um, let's, let's turn up the heat a little bit. And what if this time the two functions are themselves these algebraic fractions that we would call rational functions? f of x is 1 over x plus 2, and g of x is x over x minus 1. Now, one thing I should mention about this thing is that the domains of these things are not all real numbers, right? So for the first function, f, because it's a rational function, we can't let the denominator go to 0. Now, the denominator being x plus 2 right there, we want that not to be 0. If you solve for 0, you're going to get that x should not equal negative 2. So we want all numbers x such that x does not equal negative 2. Uh, similarly for g, right, uh, the denominator is x minus 1, so we have to make sure that the denominator is never 0. So that means x is forbidden to be the number 1. So we can identify the domains of these functions very quickly. What about their sum, difference, multiplication, and products, I should say, and quotients? Well, when it, you add together the functions f plus g, uh, you'll take f of x plus g of x. Now, in this situation, we have two fractions. Uh, f, f is 1 over x plus 2, and g is x over x minus 1. If we want to add these things together, because they are fractions, a common denominator has to be found. So take 1 over x plus 2, and then take g, uh, g, which is x over x minus 1. In this situation, our least common denominator would just be the product of the two. There's no common factors between x plus 2 and x minus 1. So it's the least common denominator would just be the product of these two things. In order to add the fractions, we have to reproportion them. Multiply the fraction by the factor in the denominator it's missing. So for example, the first one's missing x minus 1, so we times top and bottom by x minus 1. Notice that x minus 1 divided by x minus 1, this is just the number 1, a strategic number 1, but number 1 nonetheless. So times is something by 1 doesn't change its quantity, but it could change its representation like we did in this case. The, the fraction is still proportional to what it started off with, but it'll now have the common denominator we desire. Uh, the second one, we need to have x plus 2 over x plus 2. Uh, like so. And when we do that, then our fractions are going to look like 1 times x minus 1 over x plus 2 times x minus 1, like so. I'm going to erase this LCD I wrote over here. And then for the next one, we're going to end up with x times x plus 2 over x plus 2 times x minus 1. Now, as you're adding these fractions together, one thing I want to mention to you is you are going to want to distribute out the numerator, right? So you're going to take the 1 times x minus 1. You're going to take the x times x plus 2. But with the denominator, you're going to leave the denominator factored. There rarely is ever a benefit of multiplying out denominator. Sometimes people feel like, well, I have to multiply it out to be simplified. But what does simplified actually mean? Simplified is a term that's used in mathematics a lot and never really defined. I think... They, I think the reason that is is that people kind of expect that the definition's clear, but yet they don't use it according to the clear, obvious definition. To simplify something would, to be make, would mean to make it simpler. But simple is dependent on context. When we simplify something, that is, what we mean is we're trying to put it in a simpler form for the next calculation. But the problem is if we don't know what the next calculation is, that sometimes can be somewhat difficult to predict what the simplest form is. So what I can tell you with rational functions that it's nearly always the simplest thing to do to leave the denominator factored. I, and, and, and why I say that is for two reasons. One, by not factoring it, that means we have less work for us to do, which definitely I would say is simpler. But then two, 
we actually learn more about the function when the denominator is factored than when it's multiplied out. We'll see that in just a moment when we calculate the denominator. Uh, that is the domain of this fun function. So when you multiply out the numerators, you end up with an x minus 1. You're going to end up with an x squared plus 2x from the first and second parts there. Leave the denominator fact and get x plus 2 times x minus 1, like so. Now we combine like terms, which we weren't able to do in the last example. You'll get x squared plus... Well, the x plus 2x will add together to get 3x minus 1. That's our numerator. And then the denominator is x plus 2 and x minus 1. And I didn't deviate from what I said. Leave the denominator factored when you do these type of calculations right here. x squared plus x minus 1. You can leave. You do want to expand the numerator, but leave the denominator factored. Um, at this moment, we could try to factor the numerator, x squared plus 3x minus 1, and see if it cancels with any term in the denominator whatsoever. Problem is, as we try to factor a negative 1, that only factors as 1 and negative 1, and those do not add it to be 3. So it turns out the numerator is irreducible, and this fraction is reduced. When it comes to subtraction, it's going to be basically the same thing. You need to find a common denominator. So you're going to get x uh, minus 1 minus x times x plus 2. I took some liberty of going through this one a little bit faster here. Adding and subtracting fractions is really just identical. You just have to make sure you have a negative sign there and you distribute that appropriately. So the common denominator here would again be x plus 2 times x minus 1. So we times the first fraction by x minus 1 over x minus 1. The second fraction by x plus 2 over x plus 2. Make sure you distribute the negative sign when you distribute the x here as well. And so this would then give us we're going to have a negative x squared minus 2x, uh, but we have a plus x minus 1 right here over the denominator, which isn't going to change for the rest of the exercise right here. And then when we combine like terms this time, things will be a little bit different, but we get negative x squared. We're going to get a minus x, and we're going to get a minus 1 as our numerator there, x squared plus, or x plus 2 times x minus 1. Now, because everything in the numerator is negative, you might actually consider just factoring the negative sign out of the entire expression. And we sometimes like to write this in front of the fraction. That's perfectly fine. Uh, and I, I, I recommend you do such a thing. So addition and subtraction of fractions is going to work out basically the same way. Um, we have to find a common denominator and then combine things together. Now, moving on to multiplication, you're going to see that multiplication actually is super easy when it comes to fractions. Uh, when it comes to fractions, you just multiply the tops and you multiply the denominators. But remember, you were forbidden to multiply out the denominators. I told you to leave it factored. So you get x plus 2 and x minus 1 is the denominator, so nothing to do there. You're going to get 1 times x, which is just an x, and that's it. That's all there is to the multiplication there. And so something that's quite phenomenal that maybe you've never noticed before, but when it comes to fractions, multiplication is easier than addition. We're, we're, we kind of think of this counterintuitively because we usually learn how to do addition, then subtraction, then multiplication, then division of whole numbers. And so we think addition is the easiest of all the operations because we learned it first. And maybe that is true for whole numbers. But when it comes to numbers in general with fractions, it, for the rational numbers, the multiplication is an easier operation than addition because no common denominator is necessary. And the same thing can also be kind of said about division. When it comes to division, f of x divided by g of x, you get 1 over x plus 2, and you get x over x minus 1. When it comes to division, we have to multiply by the reciprocal. So you take the first fraction, 1 over x plus 2, which is f of x, you do nothing to it. And then the second fraction, when we divide it, we're just going to flip it upside down, x minus 1 over x. And then we just put it together. It's now a multiplication problem. 1 times x minus 1 is going to be x minus 1. And the denominator, I told you to leave it factored. So you get x times x plus 2. And that's all there is to division. So when it comes to fractions, rational functions, multiplication, division, super easy. Addition, subtraction, actually, were the hard parts. Now, before we, before we end this video, let's talk about the domains of these functions a little bit more. We mentioned already that the domain of f is everything except for negative 2. And the domain of g is everything except for negative or positive one, excuse me. And as such, the domain, the domain of f plus g is actually going to just be the intersection of those things. Look at the denominator here. The denominator, which we can very well see when it's factored, if the denom if x was negative 2, the x plus 2 would go to 0, the denominator would be 0. That's not allowed. And then the if x was 1, 
then one minus one would be zero, and the denominator would be zero, that would be allowed as well. And so the sum of the two fractions inherits the same restrictions that its parents had. Because f is undefined at negative two, the sum is undefined at negative two. And because g is undefined at one, the sum will be undefined at one as well. And so we see that the domain here will be everything, all real numbers x, such that x does not equal one, one, or negative two. And so the, the domain of the sum will just inherit the restrictions that the parents have. And that's also going to be true for subtraction, right? Um, if you take the difference of the two functions, then the denominator is going to, you can't have x, you can't have negative two, you can't have one. So it inherits those restrictions as well. And if we do one more of these little cases, you look at the denominator for the product, you have x plus two on the bottom, you have x minus one on the bottom. And so the denominator cannot allow for x to be negative two or one. So the domain of f times g is again the same set. x is everything except for negative two and one. When it comes to division, it's a little bit more hairy uh, because for division, we can't have any of the, we, we, we inherit all the restrictions that the parents have, but we also, there's, there's other issues that could lead to division by zero. And so let's kind of explain that for a second. If we look at the domain of f divided by g, by inspecting the final form, there's a few things you can see here. For example, x cannot equal zero because that would make this guy go to zero. X cannot equal negative two because that would make this guy go to zero. But it turns out that X cannot equal one either. So the domain of F divided by G here is all numbers except for zero, negative one, negative two, excuse me, and one. Now, while zero and negative two are typically obvious to students, sometimes we get a little bit confused about one. Why can't one be in there? One just makes the numerator go to zero, not the denominator. Now we have to remember that F divided by G is this function right here. This is where equality holds. And so we are then saying that this function circled in red is equal to this as well. And is that exactly true? Well, this right here is the simplified version of this thing right here. And so the question that really should be coming out here is, are these things genuinely equal to each other? Because when you look at that, I want you to consider the domains of these things. This thing is undefined at negative two. So is this one because you divided by x plus two. This one is undefined when x equals zero. Um, this is also undefined because that fraction, if you have a zero right here, you'll get zero and you divide by zero, right? But notice that this guy right here as a fraction is undefined at x equals one. While this one right here doesn't seem like to have that problem. So how can these two things be equal if they have the same domain? So when we write things like these two functions are equal to each other, what we mean is they're equal on their common domains, but the domain potentially could shift uh, if we're not careful. And so when it comes to the domain of these functions, when we combine them together, we need to investigate the original expression. And the original expression has three fractions in it. You have one over x plus two, and then you divide that by x over x minus one. And so you have one domain restriction, which comes from this baby fraction, uh, x can equal negative two. This is inherited from f. You have, a, uh, you have a domain problem from this baby fraction, x over x minus one. Uh, this is just g of x and g cannot equal, can't allow x to equal one. And, but then there's this mommy fraction, that the big fraction, which this can equal zero, which happens when x equals zero. And so basically what I'm saying here is when you divide fractions and simplify it, look at all of the restrictions that come from the new denominator, but also go back and look at the restrictions of the parents. And you need to make sure those are included as well, because this final form is not equal to F divided by G for all numbers. The problem is this function right here is not, is, is not defined at one because this function is not defined at one, even though this formula kind of allows for it. And in the future, when we talk about graphing rational functions, we'll see that the fact that the that you think one should be part of the domain, but it's not really, actually has an impact on the graph of the function. But that's a topic for another day. And we'll conclude this video about adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing algebraic functions and calculating their domains.